Praise team, did you, did, was I imagining something or were they singing it too? They were singing it too. <laughs> For sure, yes. Let's do that again because somehow that must have resonated with you. That there is something upon the earth that you know won't let you down. Never, never, never. you down. Cornerstone Christian Fellowship. Welcome to our Sunday morning service. Welcome to communing with friends. And if you haven't already, say hello to someone across the room that let them know that uh, you're happy to see them today. And for those of you that are joining us online, uh, put a note in the comments or in the text. We want to say good morning to you as well. We want to reach out to you. My name is James Beatty. I'm one of the elders here at Cornerstone Christian Fellowship. It is a delight to be with you this morning as we open up. Our praise and worship service but you all were already ready and in it so I don't want to interrupt so I'm a I'm gonna give you a quick quote from a theologian a mentor a civil rights leader and I ask that you stand with me as I'm about to go into praise and worship the name of the gentleman is Howard Thurman and he has this one quote because we as people are always asking how do we fit in the world and how do we play our part Howard Thurman encourages us in this way he says don't don't ask what the world need ask what makes me come alive and go and do that because what the world needs is for people to come alive and do the things that they are meant to do. 
So as we go into praise and worship today, I ask that you come alive with us this morning and praise and song to our God. Amen. church. Let's give thanks today. In the morning you sing over me. And I receive your mercy. Your faithfulness is clear to see. every day Thanks 
be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your thing we're praising God for this morning and just call it out in the space. It helps us to hear from each other, to remember what is good, and what's going on that God did for us.
My hope is in you alone, God. Now, praise and worship. Check me on this and see if I'm, I'm hearing things or missing things. But the choir seemed strong today. I know. You all have been hiding out there. Yeah. <laughs> and for those of you online, I mean, what I'm hearing is from the praise and worship team doing their thing. But there is a, there's this stereo sound coming from behind my head of people singing out to God for what they believe. And it must be, or I hope it is, the words that the song is saying. Never going to let me down. Faithful. And my trust is in God. In God alone. God is faithful. God is faithful. Yes. Yes, he is. God is faithful. All that's going around seems to let us down. For all the things that disappoint and seem to get away from us, where you're always trying to figure out how is this person trying to take advantage of me, there's something else called God that that is not a worry, that is not a concern, that is not the purpose. God is faithful. Drink that in. ask that my servers come and join me. We're moving into the part of the praise and worship service of offering. And we do this to support the ministry that goes out and, and tries to help people to understand the relationship God is trying to have with them. That God is faithful. That God is for them. And we hope that you support us in that mission as we continue to reach out to others that are seeking, right? That we're seeking for what is this pur the purpose of this life, that are seeking for how are we navigating life and every day. We ask that you continue to, to support us in that. But let me pray for you. God, we thank you for today. We thank you for your spirit that is in the room and how you are uplifting people even this morning. Continue to touch them. Continue to bless them in their households. And that the gifts that they give in support of the ministry, that you are returning to them 30, 60, and 100 fold. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. On the screen is the different ways that you can give. You can text the tithe. You can do the website. All of these things. We appreciate what you do. Also now going to dismiss uh, the children to go invite them to go to Kingdom Kids, Natalia, oh, and Bible study, Tacite and, and Natalia. They're waving their hands in their back. If you would uh, join them, and we bless them as they go. They're excited to go. They must think I'm speaking today. No, I'm, I'm, I'm not speaking today. <laughs> they went running up out of here. <laughs> they were running, weren't they? Excited for oh, okay. <laughs> you all enjoy the praise and worship team. Give them a hand.
So I have one more assignment before I turn over the mic. And I'm trying to think of how to, to, uh, to go through this and uh, be a little bit embarrassing, but then not get in trouble. Pastor T texts me like, what are you doing? Um, why do, some of you may wonder, why do I have such an uh, affection and affinity uh, to my brother here? And it's because it is amazing to me how people from such different backgrounds can have the same love for people and about the same things. So it convinces me that at times it is not your origins that determines your love for the world and how the world should be kind to one another. It is about our joint belief in Christ that helps molds us and guides us to do better and to do things to make this world just a little bit better. Welcome, my brother, Matt. That's it. Last week, Nathaniel was saying, I hope James gets to introduce you next week. I do have a video, <laughs> but I think that video will get me in trouble, man. I also noticed that uh, Steph offered Nathaniel and the girls the chance to stay and listen to me instead of going to Kingdom Church. <laughs> Nathaniel said, oh, I already read his sermon. <laughs> He was paging through it. He, he was looking through it during, during worship. He was, you know what he found? He, was, he, he would tap my shoulder. He was finding all the typos. <laughs> He's like, you, you, you uh, spelled that word wrong there, Dad. It's like, okay, well, thank you for pointing that out. <laughs> good morning. It's good to be here again. Today we are looking at John chapter 19. And... You know, we've gone a long way through John. There's only a few more chapters. But one thing I noticed as I was getting ready was how John spent so much time on this part of Jesus' story. So we had 11 chapters talking about basically the first three years of his ministry. From chapter 12 through now, we've had about one week. Chapter 13 through now has been about 20 hours. It seems like six months that we've been preaching on these 20 hours. But I think that points to something that John is trying to say, that this scene in Christ's life, he really wants us to understand what's going on. So today, that's what we want to do. We want to hear what John is saying and see what God is speaking to us through it today. So we're going to start at uh, verse 1. We're going to go through verse 16. I have my clicker here. It doesn't do any good if the slides aren't up. There we go. <laughs> then Pilate... Whoop, yes, no, that's one. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. Jumps right into it here. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they slapped him in the face. Once more, Pilate came out and said to the Jews gathered there, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out, Wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Here is the man. As soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, Crucify! Crucify! But Pilate answered, You take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. The Jewish leaders insisted, We have a law, and according to that law, he must die, because he claimed to be the Son of God. 
When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid. And he went back inside the palace. Where do you come from? He asked Jesus. But Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate said. Don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? Jesus answered, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free, but the Jewish leaders kept shouting, If you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judge's seat at a place known as the Stone Pavement, which in Aramaic is Gabbatha. It was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about noon. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, take him away. Take him away. Crucify him. Shall I crucify your king, Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priests answered. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. Mm. There's a lot there. And for people familiar with church and with this story, you've probably heard it framed in a lot of different ways. There's a lot of different characters you could focus on. You could look at Jesus. You could look at Pilate, the leaders, the crowd, even the soldiers. But what stands out to me in this passage is a different character. It's only named in verses 10 or 11, but its backdrop is there throughout. And that character is power. Power. There is a lot of power dynamics going on here. So what do we mean by power? What This word, I mean, I can't read that. I I did not go to seminary, so, but I can tell you what Sophia would say, (laughs) because I'm sure she would have this word there, um, is exousia. It's a very interesting word. It means a power of choice, being able to do what you want, having authority. Sometimes it's translated as authority having the right or privilege to command others. And this word is very common in the New Testament and throughout the Bible. It's over a hundred times it's used. So I feel like John is trying to say something about power in this passage. And that's what I want to kind of dig at, different lens to kind of look at this story we might be familiar with. And I want to point at this reality that we experience, that sometimes power is beyond individuals. It takes on a life of its own. And I think this is an idea that is important for us because as a society, we're having a conversation about so many issues and we're bumping into this idea, but it's kind of behind the scenes. We don't know how to name it. We don't know how to handle this idea that there are things bigger than what we see. Those powers influence the world around us. It drives people to do things they otherwise wouldn't do. And when we face these powers, I want us to think about what we can learn from Jesus' example confronting powers here to help us respond to the powers we face in our lives. So we'll start with a little character study. First, we have Pilate. He represents the power of Roman authority. We have the Jewish leaders. They represent the power of local Jewish spiritual and cultural authority. We have the crowd representing the voice of the everyday person. And we have Jesus, who represents and embodies the very power of the living God. Now, 
one thing that I found interesting as I was thinking about this was that each of these powers has a source. Power comes from somewhere. So let's unpack that a little bit. Sorry if it's a little small. I wanted to get it all on one slide. I think we can read it. So Pilate. If you had walked into the room and didn't really know anybody, you would probably assume Pilate had the power, right? He was the governor. He represented the hegemonic authority in this situation. You know, he was representing an empire that was in control. The Jewish leaders told him he was the only one that could kill people. That was in chapter 18, where they were kind of groveling a little bit. And from the outside, we would just think, whatever Pilate wants to do, he can do. Wikipedia says, you know, I mean, it's a source. I didn't use chat GPT for this, so <laughs> I'm trying to stay on AI on my sermons. <laughs> As Roman governor, Pilate would be the head of the judicial system. He has power there. He had the power to inflict capital punishment. He was responsible for collecting tributes and taxes. You got power when you can take people's money and for dispersing funds, including the minting of coins. He can make money. But the power that he had came from his association with Rome. The power wasn't the power of Pilate, but the power of Rome, who designated Pilate as their representative. The power wasn't his. It was Rome's. But who is Rome? Right? Where did that power come from? And you can see that the Pharisees grasped at this idea in verse 12. If you let this man go, you're not a friend of Caesar. What an interesting statement. That one gets me every time. They're saying, you don't have power to make this choice. Rome has the power, and Rome wants Jesus dead. Pilate, the governor, is being told he has no power to do what he wants. He has no exousia. It's interesting. Now, what about the Sanhedrin, the chief priests? What power do they have? Well, if we back up a little bit, it seems like if there was ever a bounded set community, first century Israel might fit that box, right? They had norms that were policed by religious leaders, and following those leaders and those norms either put you in, giving you full access to the community, connection to God, or out, which essentially meant your personhood was erased within the community. And the religious leaders were the deciders. They were the gatekeepers. They could choose who was in and who was out based on how they interpreted the law. Now, they may have claimed that their power was coming from God. But in the end, the deciders only have power when people listen to them. Did you ever meet a bully who had a little posse that would follow them around? Why do they do that? Because without the posse, there is no power. Without the pressure of many people, it's just an obnoxious voice that others will eventually shun and isolate. So the power of the gatekeepers is their ability to influence the opinions and the actions of the crowd. If they say, you aren't clean if you're a leper, it only means something if the community cares. If the community embraces the leper and continues on its way, the gatekeeper loses their exousia. And so then you have Jesus. Jesus threatened everything about that scenario. He spoke with power, with authority, with exousia. His actions oozed with exousia. Think about it. When he 
calm the winds and the waves. He wasn't looking for anyone else's help. He wasn't looking for the support or the moral encouragement of a crowd. He just did it. He had authority over sickness. He said, be well, and they were well. Authority over demons that others couldn't cast out. Be gone, and they were gone. He had authority over death. Come out, and they came out. He didn't need anybody to exert the power of God. And so when you contrast that to the spiritual leaders, and if you're watching the scenario and you're looking, you say, these people here tell me I have to do this. This person has power. He is eroding the power base of those spiritual leaders. He is coming directly against them, which is why they're such, they're, they're, they're just butting heads over and over again. He's taking their power, not by trying to manipulate the crowd, but just living out the power within himself. And so Jesus had to die. And then you have the crowd. And this is one of the really interesting things. And I was just thinking about today as we were singing together. There is something about joining together with others. One voice can sing a song, but a crowd moves us. There is a power there. And in the same way, the crowd of Jewish people standing in the courtyard there, or wherever they were, that crowd individually probably had almost no power. These were people whose lives were essentially predetermined for them in every way, right? where you live, what you do, who you marry, your socioeconomic status. You were put into a mold and just kind of went through life. And they feel that. But when you're part of a crowd, you could submit your voice and become something powerful. To the extent where the, the Romans and the Jewish leaders, they're afraid. They need that power. Ultimately, it's the crowd deciding what's going on. It's fascinating. And so this crowd can be manipulated by others. It can be used. People recognize that there is a real power here. And so those desiring power fight to grab this latent power of the crowd. And so, given that, I want to retell this passage with a lens of power. Now, this is just the Matt Kistler power translation. <laughs> you know, I offer this with grace and hope you receive it with the same. <laughs> From verse 1, the Roman power wants to exert influence and remind the crowd that it, and not the Jewish power, is in charge. So Jesus is whipped. More than that, the Roman soldiers make Jesus into an effigy of a king. Compared to the power of Rome, a Jewish king is nothing. They degrade and they mock Jewish power. They say, if you are Jewish, the height of your power is less than a mockery to our soldiers. Roman power presents this mockery to Jewish power, to the Jewish leaders rubbing in their faces their powerlessness. But the Jewish power isn't aligned with the power embodied by Jesus. They see that power as a threat. So they ignore the mockery and reassert their own power in front of the crowd. We are the gatekeepers, and this man has broken the rules. He must be removed from the community. They remind the crowd that Jewish power still controls community life. Roman power reconsiders. They go back, reconvene, try to negotiate with God's power. I can help you overcome this Jewish power if you follow me. 
God's power ignores this offer and reveals that there are bigger plans at hand than Roman versus Jewish power. The very redemptive plan of God is in process and is facing off with the structural sin that has plagued the world since the beginning of mankind. Roman power doesn't get it. What power could be greater than Rome? But Jewish power realizes their advantage and binds Roman power to its core value. There can be only one Caesar. The puppet of Roman power may want to make an alliance with God, but Rome will not allow it. In one last attempt to harness the power of the crowd, Rome presents God's power, asking the crowd to decide whether they side with the Jewish power or God's power. But it is too late, and the crowd would rather spite Rome then turn on their leaders. And the Jewish leaders, in a final stroke, offer their homage to Rome while simultaneously thumbing their nose at Rome's representative. There's a lot going on there. So what? Right? So what? I believe... Wow, that is even smaller. I try. <laughs> so we, we embrace learning and discovery. I will, I will do better next time. Okay, so if we center our lives on God, I believe we will interact with power. We are putting ourselves on a road to come against powers in this world. What might that look like? We might be confronted by angry church power who feels threatened by the way we pursue Jesus. I've experienced that. We might be confronted by angry social movements who want full allegiance to their agenda when we may only be comfortable with a small part of what they advocate for. We might be threatened by companies or corporations who benefit from damaging our community and they view their profit more highly than our well-being. We might be ignored by the schools our children attend because what's good for our children doesn't align with the power structures of education. No matter what aspect of life we want to see made better, No matter what area we speak, your kingdom come over. Schools, businesses, housing prices, equity, inclusion, the justice system, the prison system, the immigration system, even family dynamics. We need to address the powers which perpetuate and energize brokenness as much as we need to address the individual people who are in authority today. It's not just about naming and shaming an individual who holds a position today. We need to get to the root of the power behind them. And I think that John 19 gives us a good example of how we can use, wield, and confront power when we look at Jesus. So first we can notice that Jesus' power is intrinsic. It's from God, and he doesn't need to seek after the power of the crowd. Second, he's not distracted by the temptation of power when it's offered to him. He sees a bigger role and mission for his life and work. I'm just blown away by Jesus here and how he handles power. My friend Kevin, we were taking a walk together and he reminded me that Jesus was just hours away, one long evening removed from asking God to take this cup from me. Jesus was looking for a way to avoid this suffering just hours ago. He probably even hasn't slept since then. And yet here is a crowd which he could surely sway with his words and power. Here is a Roman official offering him freedom. And yet he refuses. 
In many ways, I see this as a parallel to the temptations of Jesus. He's being offered all the power in the world. If only he'd perform a sign, take the deal, or deny God. And yet he stands, silent and secure in the source of his power. In this way, I believe we have an example when we are confronting power. We need to remember we will be tempted to turn away from our center, our purpose, for the sake of more power. We'll have opportunities to be popular, to win over the crowd, to draw their anger, their fear, and their presence into our agenda. We will often be called to shun that power and walk a different path, fueled by the power of the Holy Spirit, which provides for us to persevere. And I believe that as a center set community, Cornerstone is preparing itself for this reality while also putting ourselves with a bullseye on our back to the prevailing powers of the world. We are training ourselves by weekly sitting together and working out what it means to think differently in community. We are resting in the ambiguity of what it means to neither align with one camp or another theologically. That's our blessing and our challenge, to resist the desire to just fall into the mold the world and its power wants to put us into. That liberal church, those watered-down Christians, that conservative church, that anti-Bible church, that hateful church, those charismatic Christians, those cultural revisionists, whatever label people might want to put on our community. We have a path before us which will take us through the gamut of power conflicts, but we stand. We must stand not with the intention of getting rich, of getting known, of getting big, but with the intention of remaining faithful to who God daily invites us to be. With this as our center, as our North Star, we can follow Christ's example of fearless freedom in pursuing the work set before us. And we can have hope. Hope that Christ has disarmed the powers, as Colossians 2 says. When he was nailed to the cross and uh, rose again from the grave. He disarmed the powers facing us. He made a spectacle of them. And in Revelations, we see a world made new where the powers are brought back into alignment. There will be power in this world, but it will worship our God. That is the hope we have, that we have the tools we need to resolutely stand to follow Christ even when the powers of the world stare us down. And I pray that as a people, as a community, we, like Christ, will know the source of our power. Amen. Now I'd like to call forward the servers for communion. One of the ways that Jesus confronts power is through the spectacle of sacrificial love. It's a power we have access to that undermines broken powers. Sacrificial love. In the embodiment of that love was in the meal that he shared with his disciples that we call communion. It was at night, just a few hours before this story took place, when he was sitting with his disciples, and he broke bread. He said, this is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took a cup, And he said, this is my blood, the blood of a new covenant 
shed for you. Do this as often as you drink of it, because you will be proclaiming the new kingdom. God, as we share in these elements, we proclaim our allegiance to your power. We proclaim that we stand only for you. We proclaim to the powers of this earth that you are king, that you are love, that you are good. We proclaim that by your death, and sacrifice for us, you have disarmed the broken powers of death and evil. And we proclaim through this moment together by celebrating your broken body, your shed blood, that your power is the greatest of all, that we have a hope for the future in a new kingdom that's light is you. Amen. May come forward down the middle aisles.
few announcements as we close out our service this morning. Um, our food pantry is open. If you need anything or you have a neighbor or a friend who may need something, you can stop in there and, and grab some, some items. Um, if you are visiting with us, we invite you to fill out that little card that just says hi. We, we're not going to stalk you or anything like that. We just want to say hello and follow up with you. So if you can fill that out and put it in one of the boxes in the back, we'd appreciate that. We also have our gathering room next door to come over, have a cup of coffee, hang out after service for a little bit. Um, there's also a VBS meeting after church, um, right after service in the conference room. So. We're looking for some volunteers who want to learn a little bit more about VBS and how you might be able to get involved. I would say stay, hang out with Rashida and Natalia and get to know a little bit more about that um, upcoming awesome week of VBS in July. And I think that is it for today. Thank you. If you would stand for the benediction. Did you get something out of today's service? a powerful word about power one of the prayers we had in the, in the beginning with the elders prior to service went that you would find something in this service to refresh you that will take you throughout the week so we hope that you were able to grab some of that so let me pray for this as you go dear God we thank you for this moment in time with you we thank you for the word that has gone forward, the songs that have gone up. We ask that you continue to rest in the spirit of those words and of those songs. And I ask that you touch each and every household represented here today. That you empower them, encourage them, and give them peace. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Have a great week.